So today we're in Luke chapter 15, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you that chapter in two installments. Today we'll look at verses 1 through 10, and then we'll look next week at verses 11 to the conclusion of the chapter in verse 32. And so, as is my normal way of doing things, I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 10, give you some background, lay a context and a foundation for you, then move into application. And so we're looking today at Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Let's begin reading at verse 1, and I'll read, uh, I'll read to verse 7, and then we'll pick up at verse 8 later on in the study. So beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 7, then all the tax collectors and sinners, the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep was, which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. And so let me give you a background, lay some foundation, then we'll look at these first seven verses. I'll pick up at verse 8, and we'll conclude at verse 10 in a few minutes. And so as we, we begin, throughout the Bible, God is revealed as one who seeks out those who are lost. You see it from the very beginning of the Bible. Remember with me all the way back in the book of Genesis, when you see the, the story of the fall of man, you see that it's Adam who sinned, and yet it was God who sought him out. In Genesis 3, verses 8 and 9, it says, he and his wife, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? You see, Adam and Eve had taken of the forbidden fruit. They hid themselves in shame, in remorse, in guilt. And instead of running to him and crying for mercy, they chose to try and to hide from him. They didn't seek out the Lord. It is God who sought for them, and it's God who called out to them. And he called out this question, where are you? You see, when you begin your Bible reading, and you're in the book of Genesis, and you begin to read through the scriptures, and, and all, you're in chapter 1, chapter 2. I've shared this before, but it bears repetition at this point. If you were to read the Bible, not just, we'll say, not just with the words themselves, but if you were to actually look at the punctuation, it's interesting because you'll find, you know, the end of a sentence, they put a period, you might see a comma. But you never see a question mark until the third chapter, which is interesting. So when you go through the Bible, you'll see a period, you'll see a, a colon, perhaps a semicolon, and a comma and all of that. But if you began just looking at the punctuation, it's interesting to note that the first question that's ever asked in Scripture is asked by the serpent. And the first question you find in Scripture is when the serpent says, has God said? So the first question mark you ever find in Scripture comes out of the mouth of a serpent. And the first thing that is questioned is God's Word, which is to this day the same. To this day, God's Word is constantly questioned. You see why? Because it is the Word of God that brings salvation. And if Satan can undermine our trust in the veracity of Scripture, then he can undermine the opportunities for salvation. So the very first question was related to, um, has God said? The interesting thing is the next question that is asked is, Adam, where are you? So when you listen to Satan, the next question is going to be, and now what has that done for you? Where are you? Because that's what happened. God had given him commands and said, do not eat of this particular fruit of the garden. They had taken of it, their eyes had been opened, and now God is saying, Adam, where are you? Why? Because Adam has fallen. And so it's not Adam who is looking for the Lord. It's the Lord who's looking out for Adam. And it's not as if God doesn't know where he is. It's not some, you know, cosmic hide-and-seek where Adam is hiding somewhere behind a fig leaf and God just can't see him 
and he's just walking around saying, gee, I wonder where he is. When my kids were small, we used to play hide and seek in the house all the time. And my kids would, they would try and hide from me and they would put a blanket over them and sit in the middle of the front room. And they just, and I would walk by and I would stand right next to them. Some of you, you parents have done this before. Uh, you'd, I'd stand right over them and they'd be right there in front of me. And I'd go, I'd say, Marie, I can't find the kids. Where are they? And then you hear them giggling, <laughs> you know. And, and I lift it up and it's Marie hiding. I come on, baby. <laughs> you know, you're too big to play that game. But, but we would do that. You know, we would go through the house and I would pretend. And it's not as if I didn't know where they were. I knew where they were. So, so God is not playing cosmic hide and seek in this passage. He knows where they are. What God is doing is he is saying, where are you in the sense of make your confession. Tell me honestly where you are. Seeing that you have listened to the voice of the enemy, seeing that you have, you have questioned me and, and my authority and the veracity of my word and my loving concern for you, seeing that you have chosen to take of a, a, a fruit that I have commanded you not to eat, where has that taken you? And he could ask the same question to us today, seeing that you know to do right, you know what is wrong. And, and, and yet you've listened to the voice of something, whether it's inside or outside. Something inside has responded to something outside. And you've done what is wrong. So my question to you today is, he would say to me, to us, where are you? Where has it gotten you? Where has your choice to do these things taken you? Is your life as fun as you thought it was going to be? Is it as blessed as you wanted it to be? Where has it taken you? You have questioned my word. You've questioned my love. You've questioned my concern. Where are you? And that's what we see in the book of Genesis. Where are you? Instead of running to him, crying for mercy, they chose to try to hide from him. They didn't seek him. It's God who sought them. It's God who called. Where are you? Now, when you read that, you might hear the voice when God says, where are you? You might be hearing the voice of a, an arresting officer, a police officer, who is saying, halt in the name of the law, or something like that. Stop. That's not the voice of the Lord in this passage. The voice of the Lord is in a, in a tense, in, in a way that is actually not an angry voice. It's a broken-hearted voice. It's the voice of a father who has lost their child. It's the voice of a, of a father whose child is lost, and the, and the father's crying out, for that child. When my daughter Corinne was a year old and was learning to toddle and to walk, Marie and I went to a store called Sears. There used to be Sears. <laughs> we went to a place called Sears. We went to Sears in Pomona. We were going to purchase something, and my daughter Corinne was right next to us. And I got caught up looking at some product, and Marie got caught up trying to make me buy it. And so we were looking at it. And I look, and my daughter's gone. It only takes a moment for a child to just wander off. You know this if you're a parent. It doesn't take any time at all for them just to wander off. And that she took off. She wandered off, and she's a toddler, maybe 12, 14 months, just learning to walk. And I have to tell you, there was a panic in me. There was a panic in me. Where are you? And I went looking. She was just what had gone around the corner, I thank God. But... Even back then, people were taken off with people's children. And my heart froze in my chest. So I can understand to some degree, to some degree, the voice of the Lord crying out, saying, Adam, where are you? Where are you? And it's not like he's angry. It's that his heart is broken. Why? Because his son has disappeared. Because his son has wandered off. His son is lost. God's word reveals that the reason the Lord seeks us out it's because he loves us. It's his desire to seek for, to find, and then restore those who have fallen. Psalm 78 verse 37 speaks of the nation of Israel in this way. It says, For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. He has compassion, he has love, 
and he doesn't turn away. In 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's God's desire for us. So this revelation of love that seeks is most perfectly manifested in the ministry of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is revealed as the one who seeks out the lost, that he might find them, and that he might restore them. That's what he said his, his, his mission on planet Earth was. In, in Luke 19, verse 10, he said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. In 1 John 4, 9 and 10, it says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Every father, every mother knows that when, when the mama's about to give birth, there's already a love that can be established between that parent and that child long before the child is born. All four of my kids, my grandchildren, there's already a love that I had when Marie told me we're going to have a baby. There was already a bond, or bondage, one of the two, that was beginning to take place. <laughs> there was already something strong there in my heart because this baby is going to make their appearance and then I'm going to be able to hold and love this child and that's just the way it is. So you loved your child before your child loved you. Your parents loved you long before you knew you had parents and we have a Father in heaven who loved us first. And he cares for us, and he desires to save us. And that's why Jesus said that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. And so this chapter we're looking at here, chapter 15, gives us a clear picture of the love of God that is revealed in Jesus toward us. And what you have here in chapter 15 really is a single parable that's divided into three sections or three parts. And this morning, we're going to look at the first two parts. We're going to look at the lost sheep and the lost coin. And so as we begin this, beginning in verse 1, Luke says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear, near him to hear him. So he begins by sharing with us the audience. Now this audience is tax collectors and sinners. And so Luke reveals the audience is deemed unworthy by the religious Pharisees. You see, Pharisees would not be found with these people. They were the outcasts, the, the deplorables of society. They were the tax collectors. They were the sinners. Now, a tax collector was hated. It was a hated group amongst the Jews during the time of Christ. Not that everybody loves tax collectors today. But during that day, they were a hated group. They had bought franchises from Rome, entitling them to levy taxes. It was their job to levy taxes on Jewish citizens, as well as those who were traveling through Israel. And the Jews hated them. Why? Because they hated being governed by pagans and despised tax collectors for working for pagan Rome. And so a tax gatherer was considered a traitor. They were looked at as apostates because they served pagans. They made money off of their own people's misery. Over time, many became wealthy. You see, taxes had a set standard, but many would increase the basic tax to make more money. If the basic tax was $10 on something, they would jack the price to $20. So they were making a profit off of the misery of their own people. And so they could become wealthy. You see that in the case of a man named Zacchaeus. In Luke 19, verses 1 and 2, it says, Jesus entered, the, entered and passed through Jericho. Now, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So when Jesus went to stay at Zacchaeus' house, the people grumbled about it. In Luke 19, verse 7, it says, When they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. They hated Zacchaeus because he was uh, a man profiting off of them. And then they have the sinners. The sinners had poor reputations. They didn't live according to the law of Moses. They were known for their exceptionally sinful lives, openly sinful lives. You see, there are people whose sins are apparent, and there are other people whose sins follow after them. 
There are some people, when you see them, you know this person sins. You just know it by looking at them. This person sins. You can see it. Maybe they're standing there with a the cigarette and the wrong end in their mouth. <laughs> this person's a sinner. You know that. Then there are others who hide it well. You look at them, and they look like decent people, and, but they're still sinners. So some sinners are obvious, and others are hidden. These people were notorious. It's like that woman in Luke 7 who came to Simon the Pharisee's house and the one who had washed Jesus' feet with her tears and all. And when Simon saw her approaching Jesus, remember Simon said within himself, if this man truly were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is that's touching him. And then he goes on to say, for she is a sinner. She was quite obvious a sinner. She was known for her sin. She wasn't hiding her sin. So the reputation had followed her in to that room. And so Jesus is there with people like that, sinners, people who don't care about the law. And yet, these are the people who are gathering to listen to him speak. Now, something about Jesus made them comfortable with him. They came to hear him. And I have to be honest with you, Jesus, as you read your Bible, he never minced words. He didn't change his way he spoke. He was very clear. He didn't hide truth from people, you know. Uh, I've been in the ministry a long time, and I read a lot of material, a lot of magazine articles and things like that about the state of the church today, things that relate to the church. And uh, there are quite a number of people who are writing concerning reaching uh, this uh, generation. They call them the millennials and all. And, and there are quite a number of people who are writing and giving suggestions. And part of what they've been saying is don't say things that are hard to hear. Don't offend them. But I, I've read other things, and and it says quite the opposite. As a matter of fact, I, I know that um, human beings, whether they're called by Gen X, millennial, or, or whatever you want to call them, you know, we create such artificial categories anyway. What we need is we need the truth, and we need to be loved. That's what we need. And Jesus did not hide the truth. And Jesus loved the people. And he didn't change what he was saying. He didn't look at his audience and say, oh my goodness, I got a lot of young people here. I better be careful not to make them sad. He didn't do that. He would just speak the truth. Why? The, the truth will set you free. Because that's what it is. I, I, I'll, I'll note that with you for just a second. In, in chapter 14, uh, verse 25 through 27, notice this with me. It says, now great multitudes went with him. He turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Verse 25 says, great multitudes. You would think that Jesus would want great multitudes to listen. But what did he do with the multitude? He challenged them. He says, you've got to leave it behind and follow me. In verse 33 of the same chapter, he says, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So Jesus didn't mince words. He didn't make it easy to hear. He told the truth. And his love for them and his authority was extremely attractive. That is something that, that they needed. And because he loved them and because the word was true, they listened closely. I remember a guy in this fellowship years ago now who told me, and he, he was talking to me, and he said, yeah, I just gave my heart to the Lord. And I looked at him and I said, you, you've been here for years. I recognize you. You know, you'd be surprised. But a lot of people choose where they, they sit, and they, they sit there every week, don't you? And I, and I will look out, and I will see, oh, yeah, they're here, you know. Oh, I wonder where they're at. You know, because I, I will see you, you know, and you'll be surprised, especially in the, the front. I start saying, mm, they're... anyway, I had, I wonder, anyway, he... He had said to me, because I saw him, he said, I just gave my heart to the Lord, and I was looking at him, and I said, you've been here for years. You've been here for years. He goes, yeah, yeah. I said, and you just gave your heart to the Lord? Listen, I thought that anybody who was here for years, they got to be saved to put up with me that long. <laughs> but he said, no, I just gave my heart to the Lord. Just because someone comes to church and comes regularly doesn't mean that they're saved. 
And also, sometimes they come to hear and to listen. And sometimes they may be notorious sinners who find a comfort at being in a group of people that has something different than what they live. And after a while, they begin to hear, what is that difference? And you'll be surprised at the amount of people, perhaps you're not, you wouldn't be surprised, at the amount of people who can give their hearts to the Lord because there's just something about Jesus. Listen, Christians are to share the truth, but we do it with compassion and concern. There are people right now that I, I really believe are very angry Christians. They're very angry Christians. They're mad about everything. Mad about everything. Oh, everything. And, uh, and so they tell people, you know, you rotten sinner, you know. And, and <laughs> it's not that sometimes you aren't up front. I have to be real with you about that. But... They'll tell people, and they're mad. They're always picketing about something. They're always mad about something, you know. And, and I, I discovered a long time ago, if you, if you want to be successful in terms of learning to communicate, well, what is most important for you is two things. One is the truth, and two is love for the people. If you love people, tell them the truth. But tell the truth, speak the truth, Paul said, in love. Love the people you're speaking to, and, and learn to weep for them. Learn to weep for the lost because a lot of us have forgotten because they can be so obnoxious sometimes. People can be so, so difficult. They, they're always looking for something bad and they're always saying something negative. And, and, and if, if they know you love them, they'll listen. Listen, people can correct me. Yes, they do. And they can. It especially is, is listen to, you know, with more eagerness, if you will, if, if I know that person correcting me loves me. You know, when my wife corrects me, you know, uh, I'm not going to sit her saying, I don't go home saying, honey, can you correct me today? I'm I don't do that. But I'll tell you, when she does, I know that her correction comes from a heart that loves me. I know that she wants the best for me. I know that. And I may not appreciate hearing and sometimes, well, always I don't. But when I hear it, I take it to the Lord and I investigate my heart and I ask God, if that's true of me, I need to change because I don't want to be that person, and that's the way it works. So when you speak, you ought to love the people you're speaking to. The psalmist said it in Psalm 126, verse 6. He said, he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him, learning to weep for the lost. And so... Jesus is there ministering, and these people are lost. But notice the Pharisees, verse 2. The Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, earlier, they had found fault with his disciples eating with tax collectors and sinners. In Luke 5, 29 and 30, it speaks of Matthew, Levi. It says, Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them and their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Well, now they take issue with Jesus himself, and they complain. Notice in verse 2 their complaint. He receives sinners and eats with them. The word receive means to accept into companionship and not reject. It means to accept warmly and lovingly. In other words, they're saying he receives them because he's a man of similar character. He receives them because he is like them. He's eating with them. You need to understand that during that day, eating a meal, and it's still pretty true today, eating a meal with somebody was more than just eating a meal. In that day especially, it was if I invited someone to my house, we would have a bowl that we would dip our bread in. It's kind of like if you go to a Mexican restaurant or whatever, and you have your chips and your salsa. And so you would dip in the same bowl. You guys know this. I mean, you go to a restaurant or at home and you have salsa, you have some, some chips and all of that. You dip and your wife comes, your kids come. You know, Marie tells me no double dipping. That really bothers me. <laughs> go to a restaurant and you have, you know, six people around a table. You have some salsa. Are you through with that? Yeah, yeah, okay, and you'll take it, and you'll eat, you'll eat out of that bowl. I do, but have you ever looked at the people in the table next to you that you don't know? Have you ever said, excuse me, are you through with your chips and salsa? 
I ran out. Can I have yours? No. Why not? We are very careful who we swap spit with. That's in the Greek. We are. We're careful who we share saliva with. That's a fact. And when someone would eat with a sinner, that was much, much more than simply having a meal. They're saying he's like this person. This man is sharing in a way that you only share with intimate friends or family. That's why they had a problem with him. And that's why they're saying he receives these people because he's like them. They're the same type of people. And so he's being attacked. He's being attacked for being a friend of sinners. But he still is a friend of sinners. And I thank God for Jesus who hasn't stopped being our friend. And so he's speaking there. Now, verse 3. He sees this taking place. He sees what's taking, what's being said. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And so he begins to give us insight through three parables. The first insight he's giving is that he's a good shepherd. And notice, he's a good shepherd who seeks after the lost sheep. In Israel, shepherds often developed a strong bond with their sheep. Sheep would be raised for food, but they were also used for their wool. And uh, more often, they would be used for the wool. And so what had happened is the sheep actually developed a, a, a close bond with the shepherd. And Jesus speaks of that. And that's one of the reasons why in John chapter 10, he called himself a good shepherd. He called himself the good shepherd because he gives us insight into a relationship of a shepherd with sheep. In John 10, 3 and 4, it says here, to him, Jesus speaking, to him, the owner of the sheep, to him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And so he's speaking concerning the relationship of a sheep and a shepherd. He says that the sheep hear his voice. and In other words, they recognize his call. When a sheep is out and, and grazing, the shepherd will call and the sheep recognizes the voice. He says he calls his own sheep by name. So he gives his sheep certain names. He calls one Daisy, the, uh, the other one he calls lamb chop, but he, he gives them names, shish kebab. He gives them names. And so he calls his own sheep by name because of that relationship that he has with them. And third, he said he leads them out and goes before them. In other words, he is taking care of them. He is safely leading them. He goes before them. There was a guy in Israel. He was on his first trip. He sees a shepherd. He sees some sheep. He sees the shepherd behind the sheep and turns to his guide and he says, listen, I've read my Bible and the Bible speaks of the shepherd going before the sheep and, and they follow his voice. I, I thought for sure when I was here in Israel that I would see the shepherd in front of the sheep. But I'm looking there and I see a shepherd and I see the sheep, but the shepherd is behind the sheep and not in front of them and I'm a bit confused. Doesn't that happen anymore? And so his guide says, no, no, that still happens in Israel. There are still the shepherd who names the sheep, goes before them, and they follow his voice. That's true. But that isn't the shepherd. That's the butcher. <laughs> and so the shepherd goes before the sheep. And that, Jesus says, is what he does. He goes before them. He, he brings them safely to home. And it says that the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. They have a personal response. 
You see, when sheep were born, the shepherd attending the birth of the lambs would be there and the, the baby would, would part the womb and would come out. And the shepherd very often would take the newborn lamb, the newborn, and would dry it off, wrap it, dry it off, hold it, and begin to speak to it, even name it. And would actually develop a tender relationship with that little sheep. And from the very beginning that it parted the womb, it would know the voice of the shepherd. The shepherd would speak to the sheep. The sheep would know it. He'd give it a name, whatever the name may be. And that, that little sheep would respond. And so when it was out there with a, a hundred sheep, he could call Daisy or whatever, and the little sheep would perk up her ears, and she would come walking. Why? Because she knew the voice of the shepherd. And Jesus was simply playing on what the Jews knew at that time. And he's speaking concerning the love that a shepherd has for a sheep. You see, the sheep belong to the shepherd, and he cares for them. Not only did he care for them, but he also counted them. He knew how many they were. Jesus is speaking concerning a hundred sheep, and if he loses one, he goes seeking for it, leaving the 99 in the care of somebody else while he finds the lost one. So he knows how many sheep he has, and he goes looking for them when one goes astray, and he searches until he finds it. And so what is it that he's speaking about? Well, the lost sheep is a, a picture of a lost sinner. This is a, a, a sinner, a person who's following their own heart. They're not thinking about their course of life. They're simply wandering through life. It's, it's a picture that, that Paul gives us in Ephesians 2 when he says in verses 1 and 2, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So he said, in which you once walked. That word walked in the original language in Greek. It speaks of walking aimlessly. It speaks of meandering. You went from place to place. You just meandered. And he's saying that before you had a relationship with God, your life was empty. You had no purpose. You had no direction. You didn't know which way you're going. You wake up one morning and you'd say, well, I'll try this today. A few months later, it didn't work. You'd just do something different. Your whole life was that way. It was moving from one thing to another, trying to find some satisfaction, find you, trying to find a pasture to graze and trying to find some water to drink, trying to find something that would that would, would fill the emptiness of your life. And, and that's what Paul says happened to us. We, we meandered. We were aimless. We had a pointless life. We moved from thing to thing, place to place. And that's what happened with this sheep. The sheep wandered off looking for greener pasture and ended up lost. And the shepherd is the one that goes after it. You see, that sheep may not even be aware that it's lost, but the shepherd knows it is. There are times that, that people will wander off. Even at, you, Some of you are married to people who wander off. Some of you have kids who kind of wander off. And you say, where is he? Oh, no, he's... Because some, some of us do that. Marie keeps an eye on me. Because I'll be doing something and she'll be looking at something and, and I get distracted and I just wander off. And so she knows that about me, you know. I, I know where she is, but she didn't know where I am. And then there's sometimes that people wander off and they don't even know they've wandered off. But the person, you know, it's their turn to watch them. That person is wondering Where'd they go? And they go searching for them. Children do this notoriously, but people in general can't. And that's the point. There are times that you are just wandering. You're just meandering. But there's somebody who knows you're gone who's coming after you. That's the good shepherd who's following you, looking for you, calling for you. How's he call for you? By the gospel. By the gospel. And that message goes out, and he's calling to your ears so that you might know that you're lost because you can be lost, as you know, and not even know you're lost. <laughs> that happened to Marie and me just a couple of days ago. We were driving, and I took the wrong turn. And as we're driving, she says, you know, you're going in the wrong direction. And I looked at her, and I said, but my dad used to say, I said, you know, I've, I've just always wanted to, to see this neighborhood. <laughs> you know, I always wanted to see this neighborhood. She said, you're lost. I said, no, I've got a general idea where I'm at, you know. But that's true. You can turn and go in a direction that you don't even know you're moving in the wrong direction. And so Jesus is calling to us, and that's what he's pointing out. Now, Jesus reveals himself as the shepherd who seeks out the sheep, and is revealing his love, his tender concern for the lost. 
It reveals the persistence of Jesus seeking those who are lost. Ezekiel 34 says it like this in verses 11 and 12. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he's with them. So will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. Now, undoubtedly, the shepherd is calling out in the wilderness for his sheep by name. Like it says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. And notice verse 5, when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Now that little sheep is exhausted. It needs to be carried to safety. It may be injured. I've discovered that a life of sin is exhausting. Have you? A life of sin is exhausting. When you're 13, 14, 15, and you're starting to discover sin and things you can do that are wrong, and you can stay out when you're 16, 17, 18, you can stay out all night. You can stay out until 3 or 4 in the morning, wake up at 6 and go to work. You're not exhausted yet. But if you continue a life of sin, after a while, your whole life is exhausting. It seems like it's just one depressive moment after another, one lost opportunity after another, one thing you have to live down after another. And the more and more you grind out life, the tireder you get. The more you try this and it doesn't work, and then I'll try this and it doesn't work, and you're going day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, you're grinding out life, and it is exhausting. There's no joy. There's no rest. There's no satisfaction. There's nothing but thirst. There's a loneliness in your heart, and you're reaching out, but you don't know what you're reaching out for. And Jesus says, I'm looking for you. I'm following after you. I'm calling you by name. But as long as you're just out there in sin, it is exhausting. Psalm 30, 38, verse 8 says, I am feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. I am severely broken. Nothing's working for me. That's what led me to get saved, by the way, is one day I finally remember waking up saying to God, you've got to do something for me because I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. God help me. God help me. God, I still remember that. 20 years of age, but I still remember that. God, I can't do this. I'm so tired. I'm so tired of hurting people. I am so tired of hurting my parents. I am so tired of the life I've chosen. I am so tired of this. God, help me. I was exhausted. I was exhausted. But notice that the sheep does not find him. That's because the shepherd wasn't lost. The sheep would be anxious, so he gently comforts the sheep. He carries it home. Like Isaiah 40, verse 11 says, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. And notice verse 6, he calls together his friends and neighbors, and he says to them, rejoice with me. He's filled with joy. And it isn't because of financial concern. He's filled with joy because the sheep is safe. And he gives joyful, a joyful party because that sheep that was lost has been found. But the self-righteous Pharisees, they didn't rejoice that these people were there listening and coming to him. You know, we have people who, who uh, are actually angry. We have had people angry at our church because we led their family to Christ. We've had people call the church. And, and I remember one conversation in particular where they called the church and they said, my son was into drugs and alcohol. He was addicted. But he's now going to your church, and I want to know what's going on there because he's changed. And I, this is what they said. I, can, I could handle it while he was an alcoholic and a doper. I cannot handle it now that he's a Christian. There are people who prefer the lost to stay lost. Even... Even, even the religious people sometimes would just as soon argue about how that person got saved or if they're even saved, and they want to argue that person out of their salvation. I've told you before about the church during the Jesus movement, when hippies were coming to faith in Christ, there was a particular church in another state that had a barber on staff so that when a hippie came forward, the first thing they did is they took him after praying with him and cut off his hair. Because they knew that Jesus wore short hair, therefore every believer does. Crazy. 
But that's what we do with people. You can't possibly be saved. You've got tattoos. You can't be saved. You've got piercings. It's trippy to me. It really is. I've told you this before. People go out and they buy their tattoo. That thing is permanent. You know that. And you put that little hummingbird on the small of your back. It's going to become a vulture. You know that. And, and, and when you're walking, bad decisions, but that one's permanent. So what happens is, is they would say to us, you can't be saved because... And so there are people who are trying to quench what the Spirit of God does. The self-righteous, pharisaic spirit that some people have actually has a tendency of quenching the work of the gospel. And so these Pharisees could not rejoice that these sinners and tax gatherers are coming to faith in God. And that's why Jesus is speaking in this way. And in verse 7, he says, I say to you, that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. In other words, God rejoices when the lost are found. And this joy, well, the one who has joy and desires to share it is the owner of the sheep. There are 99 just persons, he says, who need no repentance. That's an interesting thing to say. When he says there are 99 just persons who need no repentance, these are not truly righteous people, but 99 self-righteous people. These are people that society respects, but are still lost. These are the Pharisees. They were those who thought that they were righteous, but they were self-deceived. In Luke 18, 9, Luke says he, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And look down on everyone else. You see, the Pharisees were self-righteous. They didn't think that they needed to repent. In Luke 5, 31 and 32, Jesus said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In John 9, 41, Jesus said, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. See, though there's none so blind as the one who refuses to see. And the Pharisees could not get it. They couldn't understand it. How that these tax gatherers and these sinners were listening to Jesus and getting saved. So naturally they said within themselves, this is wrong. And then that man there, Jesus, is just like those, those, uh, those other people. He's just like those tax gatherers. He's just like them because they have things in common. And that's why Jesus is speaking and he's making it clear that they're self-righteous. Then he moves on in verse 8 to say this. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully till she finds it? When she's found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which was lost, which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So this is the second part of the parable, a woman and her lost coin. She had ten, she loses one. Instead of ignoring its loss, she searches for it. The question has to be asked, why? Well, because of its value to her. And it wasn't necessarily something that was monetary. Married women had a headdress made of ten silver coins linked by a silver chain. Sometimes a woman would save for years to amass her ten coins. Her headdress was like her wedding ring. And it could never be taken from her, even to pay off a debt. It had great sentimental value to her. So in her dark home, she had lost her coin. And she's searching diligently. And Jesus uses this image to emphasize his searching for us until he finds us. You see, we're like that lost coin, covered with dust, lost, useless, until found. No longer a, a coin lost. The longer a coin's lost, the less probability is there of it being found. There are those who are lost for an entire lifetime. They sink deeper and deeper into sin. Sin becomes their identity. And being lost, their way of life. They get known by their sin. And that's their reputation. And that becomes their identity. While the woman's coin is lost. But she doesn't give up on finding it. 
She tirelessly searches for it because she values it. And she uses a lamp to shine a light into the darkness so that she might find it. When Marie and I were young and I asked her to marry me, I gave her her engagement ring and then on our wedding day I gave her her wedding ring. Her wedding ring cost $200. It was all I had. I didn't have any more than that. And so I bought her a wedding ring. It had a carrot, one, I'm sorry, a quarter carrot. That's how small it was. It looked like a grain of sand. <laughs> and, and so I gave it to her, and that's all I could afford. And so I gave her this ring and, and all. And, but, you know, you could hardly even see the, the rock on it. Call it a rock. <laughs> well, one day we were at a Bible study. And while we were at the study, she looked down at her hand, and, and the, the sand had fallen out. <laughs> <laughs> so... She was upset, and she says, I can't, I lost my diamond, I lost my diamond. I'm looking at her, and I, I, I said, honey, I, I don't know what to say. I lost my, I lost my, and she starts to tear up, right? And so I said, I'll go and find it for you, baby. I'll see if it's in the car. Well, I'm night blind. I can't see in the dark. So I go out anyway. I open up the car door, and I look down, and, and there's this little teeny thing glittering, I, I, I thought it was a piece of glass, but no, it was the diamond. And I, I brought it in, you know, carefully, just carrying that heavy thing in, and, and we went and had it re, reset. And, you know, the value, it wasn't the value of the money, because it's only a couple hundred bucks. It was the sentimental value of the ring. That meant something. And Jesus is telling us, that we mean something. Not what we are, you know, capable of doing for him, but who we are. And he loves us. And he made every effort to discover us. And there we are, we'll say, under the dust of a bed, if you will. And he goes down with a light and he searches with the gospel of, of grace and it shines on your darkened life and then he finds you and brings you to himself. And as he did that, he begins to rejoice. Look at verse 10. I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There's joy before the angels of heaven. There are those who say at invitations, they'll say, right now the angels are rejoicing. That's not what Jesus said. I want you to see what he said. He said, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God. It's not the angels that are rejoicing. It's God who's rejoicing. God is rejoicing for you. God found you. And the angels, see, salvation is something they don't understand. See, the fallen angels will never be recovered. The ones who never fell will have no need of recovery of any sort. They're still unfallen angels. They don't know the magnitude of the love and grace of God to salvation. God knows what it costs because God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for you. And he knows what it costs when his son put his hands on that cross, was nailed in, when his feet were nailed to that post, when his head was swollen from being beaten, when the thorns were placed on his brow, when he had that that spear pierced his side when he cried out and said, it is finished. God knows what it costs to save you, and God rejoices when you're saved. That's how it works. He loves you. You have to understand that today. He loves you, and he gave his son for you. And Jesus said, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God when one sinner rejoices, is saved. Why? Because God rejoices that you were found. You may think that you have little value, and perhaps to the world, you do. To the world. But to God, he loved you so much, he gave his son to die on a cross for you. And you say, how much do you love me, God? And Jesus speaks and says, I love you so much. I love you this much. And he stretches out his arms, and he dies on a cross for you. That's the depth of God's love that we have yet to understand. 
but it is that love that rescued you when you were wandering in the darkness looking for green pastures and he was crying out your name all along by the gospel and he was saying come home come home come to me come to me come to me like the mother who's standing there at, at the window as her, her wayward child is out there in the streets doing bad things and she just every night she just stands there looking at that window just looking at that window because one day that child she's praying will come walking up that driveway and come home well that's what God has been doing for so many people for so long and he's just crying out your name where are you come home well guess what we said here am I Lord forgive me and he said, welcome home, my child. I love you. I gave up my, my son for you, and I am going to be with you, and you will be with me forever. Why? Because that's the God that we serve, a God who loves us and gave his son for us. <laughs>